Hello everyone, I hope you are doing well. Today is our monthly Q&A, so let me apologize in advance to all those whose names I will butcher throughout this video. Before we get to the questions, let's get high on tea. This week's tea is Sui Yanzi or Broken Silver, a rather new invention based on poor tea. Sui means broken or an object in small pieces. Yan means silver, which was used as the currency in ancient China. Tea merchants in the old days often used small silver pieces as a method of payment in transactions. So, broken silver, named after the shape of this kind of poor tea, has a nice meaning. So, let's look at the shape of a Sui Yanzi tea. Now, let's talk further about this tea. In the Haiyan Tea section of a prior video titled Xiu Dao Concepts 16, Refine the Emptiness and Merge with the Dao, I introduced a unique poor tea, Lao Cha Tou, which means old tea nuggets. Basically, Lao Cha Tou is the byproduct of the tea stacking process in the fermentation of a ripe poor. In this process, some leaves agglomerate into small blocks, which people call Lao Cha Tou. So, Lao Cha Tou is the result of the agglomeration of tea leaves during the stacked fermentation process of producing ripe pu'er. The stronger pu'er flavor of Lao Cha Tou compared to the regular pu'er made Lao Cha Tou very popular years ago. About 10 years ago, a couple of tea manufacturers began to promote a tea named Sui Yanzi or Broken Silver. Well, Lao Cha Tou or Old Tea Nuggets is the natural byproduct of the poor tea fermentation process. Sui Yanzi, on the other hand, is the rather deliberate modification of poor. So, how is Sui Yanzi produced? Well, very often, Shu Pu'er or Ripe Pu'er Tea is the main ingredient plus some other key ingredients such as Nu Mi Cao or Strawberry Lenses Toki Nessis, Lando, a plant from Yunnan province of China that is good for health. By the way, the literal translation of Nu Mi Cao is sweet rice grass because its leaves possess a special fragrance of sweet rice. Sweet rice fragrance is expected for high-quality ripe pu'er and Nuo Mi Cao is the secret ingredient added to Sui Yanzi tea in order to strengthen the expected ripe pu'er flavor. As a result, no matter what kind of Shu pu'er is used as the base for Sui Yanzi, the broken silver tea will definitely possess a strong sweet rice flavor. This is another reason behind the popularity and also the high price of Sui Yanzi soon after its initial availability in the market years ago. So, different ingredients are mixed together including poor tea powder, Nuo Mi Cao, the sweet red flavor grass, hydrochloris, and so on, and then reshaped into small pieces resembling broken silver. That's how Sui Yanzi is produced. As Sui Yanzi is the modification of a poor earth, its health benefits are largely the same as that of a poor earth. Nuo Mi Cao and the other ingredients put together. Like many other teas, 
People drink sui yanzi for its strong poor flavor rather than for its health benefits. Sui yanzi is the best brewed with water at 100 degrees Celsius for 30 seconds. Some people even boil it for as long as a couple of minutes. I have a few boxes of sui yanzi with leaves of different shapes. This one is among the better ones. This is the tea leaf. And uh, this is the color of the tea decoction. You can see the beautiful color indicating a good poor tea. For disclosure, I do not consume sui yanzi too often since I prefer naturally produced tea over artificial modifications. It is often very hard to determine the ingredients used in artificially modified tea. Sometimes I only add a few pieces into poor tea to enhance its taste. If I have visitors who prefer ripe poor, I may add a few pieces of sui yanzi into the teapot to enhance the flavor. So, I treat sui yanzi as more of a poor additive than as the standalone tea. Do let me know your experience with sui yanzi. Again, you may not like the idea of sui yanzi, but you most likely will enjoy the flavor of this tea. With that, let's answer some questions asked by our community members. First, from Alpha JRL, energy point concept. Next, from Alpha JRL, English translations of Chang Nai Zhou's works. Next, from Darwin Dog, drills in sword and saber practice. Next, from Darwin Dog. Fa Jin with weights. Next, from Nei Jia Quan, Xuan Pin in Dao De Jing. Next, from William Palmery, Wu Qi Zhang. Next, from Save Lives, Intention in Qi Gong and Xiu Dao. Next, from T P, Lao Cha Tou. Next, from Da Cheng Ruo Que, Dragon Usage in Terminology. Finally, from new mini body coordination in Fa Jin. So let's get started. Alpha JRL asked a question about the energy point concept. He said, quote, I read in several places that for health or spiritual qi cultivation and internal martial art practice using Fa Jin, one should open the four gates namely the Lao Gong area in the hands and the Yong Quan area in the legs. What is the meaning of an opening, a point or an area, and if it is a necessity for advancing in the internal arts, how actually we can do it, and how we can know that we actually did open those gates? Thank you for this question. Offer JRL. Very impressive to see this topic mentioned by someone outside of China. Yes, it is indeed a very deep question, and I'd like to provide a brief answer today. In the practice of Qigong and internal martial arts, some important body areas are usually expressed using acupuncture points and require special attention toward developing their functions in terms of energy exchange. Very often, people only pay special attention to the Dantian areas and Baihui areas in Qigong practice. Actually, Lao Gong and Yong Quan, which are located on the hands and the feet respectively, are more important in practice in terms of developing energy exchange functions. 
in Qigong practice. These four points are considered to directly exchange energy inward and outward from the body. This concept is not that popular and its practice is even rarer in both China and the West. I studied it while I was a teenager and have applied this practice to many of my students. Basically, the concept of opening O Kai in Chinese means to enable that area to better exchange energy. To do so, there are two approaches. One is that a practitioner followed some energy practice which stimulates these four points, eventually opening them. The other approach is that a teacher will stimulate these points by using his or her own energy. Not a difficult practice, but requires some experience. Again, these four points are important, with the two points on the palms being more important than those on the feet. This technique is used in Qigong practice and is beneficial but not necessary for the internal style of martial arts. There is no direct relationship between these practices and the martial ability. This topic is considered advanced training, especially in relation to energetic practice, and is hard to detail in Q&A videos. I hope that answers your question. Let's move on to the next one. Offer GRL also asked another question about Chang Mai Zhou and uh, his works. He says there are two books in English that talk about his work and uh, he wants to know my opinion about them. Thank you for this question as well, Offer GRL. In the previous video titled Internal Style Concepts 60, Gang Rou Yin Ba Gua, I mentioned that it's not easy to translate a book into English without a prior deep understanding of a martial art practice. Furthermore, the interpretation of a document is a lot more important than simple translation. For example, the six Word proverb Ro Guo Qi Gang Luo Lian took me three videos to explain in the context of each of the internal styles, and that's merely scratching the surface. To directly answer your question, I have never read English translations of these books, so it's very hard for me to comment on them. What I'm talking about here is based on my experience of skimming through English translations of some other Chinese martial documents, not these specific two books. I am aware that may not be the answer you are looking for, but that's the best I can provide. Hope that helps offer JRL. Let's move on to the next one. Darkman Duke ask about sword and saber drills similar to Lan Naja drills used in spear training. Thank you, Dr. Wenduk. There are many basic drills in Chinese martial art weapons practices. As is the case with spear practice, both sword and saber practice also have basic drills. The sword and the saber use different drills with additional differences depending on the style. There are eight basic movements for saber training. Kan, chopping. Liao, upward leading. Ci, piercing. Jie, pushing. Lan, blocking. Bong, pressing. Zhan, cutting. Mu, slicing. Dai, pulling. Chan guo, wrapping and so on. Along with 13 basic movements for the sword, ci, piercing, 
、点、pointing、聊、pairing、崩、pressing、脚、stirring、劈、chopping、拦、blocking、磨、slicing、扫、sweeping、削、intercepting、挂、pulling、截、pushing and 提。Upward leading. There are different types of the saws available in terms of the rigidity of the blade, soft blade saws and hard blade saws, each used in different drills. Likewise, the saber will also have different drills depending on the length of the handle, which is the key differentiating factor between. Single hand and double hand sabers. Even though the eight and thirteen basic movements for the sword and the saber respectively can cover most of the techniques, the combinations of those basic movements make the practice of each weapon interesting and challenging. I will systematically introduce Chinese weapons practice in the future. So please stay tuned. Now let's look at his next question. Darwin Duke also asked a fudging question. Quote: Is there a way to practice this with a weight like a dumbbell or a barbell? A lot of boxing coaches said we shouldn't practice punches while holding weight because it can damage our joints. But since heavy spear can be used. To train fajin, I wonder if normal weights can be used safely too. End quote. Good question indeed. In my opinion, training with weights is a good idea as long as the weight in your hands is manageable. In other words, if you can practice your routines and forms without any major difficulties, then that is not a problem at all. However, speaking from observation, a lot of dumbbells and barbells can be very heavy and may not be suitable for practicing martial art movement such as punches. There are two type of spear training for fighting practice. One is with a heavy spear, and the other with a light spear. The heavy spear is used to train the back power, while the light spear is used to train the shoulder and the chest power. Furthermore, the heavy spear is good for training the shaking power, while the light spear is good for training the sharp power. And there are many more detailed differentiations between using these two types of spears. Unfortunately, many people in the community misunderstand the differences between the different type of spears in terms of length and weight, and mistakenly believe them to serve the same purpose. It's just wrong. Even in ancient times on the battlefield, different types of spears were used for different military purposes. Lacking knowledge of ancient Chinese weaponry is the major reason why some people wrongly believe that all spear practices should use long and heavy spears. So, make sure to use the right equipment or weapon for each training objective. Again, using a lightweight device such as the barbell is not an issue if handled carefully. Martial training requires strength. I hope I have answered both of your questions, Dr. Wen Duke. Let's move on to the next one. Andrea Morizi, A.K.A. Nei Jiaquan, asked about Xuan Pin in Chapter Six of Dao De Jing regarding its idigrams in the internal styles. By the way. Andrea is a student of mine who lives and teaches martial arts in Italy, including Xing Yi and Ba Gua. Thank you, Andrea. This is a great question. I'd like to answer this question in the context of Xiu Dao practice and not the internal style of martial arts.
The term Xuan Pin is mentioned in the sixth chapter of the Dao De Jing, one of the oldest Chinese philosophy books. Xuan means mystery. Pin can have different meanings, including valley and female animal. In ancient times, the Chinese character Pin referred to the female reproductive organs of an animal. Pin symbolizes the reproductive organs that produce all beings. Put together, Xuan Pin means the root of the generation of everything, or Dao. In the sixth chapter, Lao Zi said, quote, Gu Shen Bu Si Shi Wei Xuan Pin, Xuan Pin Zhi Men Shi Wei Tian Di Gen, Mian Mian Ruo Cun Yong Zhi Bu Qin, end quote. Translation The spirit of the valley is an immortal being. It is called the subtle and the profound female. The gate of the subtle and the profound female is the root of heaven and the earth. It exists formlessly, but its unity is never worn out. This is an important chapter of the Dao De Jing. The term valley spirit can also mean vacuity or emptiness, another term for Dao, which is the general source of all things. Throughout Dao's history, Dao's scholars and practitioners have used this term to describe Xiu Dao practice. For example, Xuan Pin Zhi Men, in this chapter, or the gate of the subtle and profound female, is also called Xuan Guan or Mystery Gate, another important Xiu Dao term, which I have introduced in a prior video titled Mystery Gate of Xuan Guan in Xiu Dao, number 7. Link is in the description. In that video, I emphasized the importance of entering the mystery gate in practice in order to convert postnatal energy to prenatal energy in the Xiu Dao practice. So, Xuan Guan is one of the most important imageries that Lao Zi used to describe the term Dao, the core concept of Dao De Jing, which tells us to cultivate formless energy in order to never wear out. Chinese internal practice, especially Xiu Dao practice, is rooted in Chinese philosophy. Actually, almost all of the Xiu Dao concepts can be traced back to the Dao De Jing. What Xiu Dao practitioners in different generations have done is to realize those concepts through practice. Andrea, I hope that answers your question. Let's move on to the next one. William Palmery asks, quote, There is a style called Wu Qi Zhang that is practiced and referred to as the precursor or mother form practiced prior to the Tai Chi being formulated. Is it true? End quote. Thank you for the question, William. I have never heard about this style, Wu Qi Zhang, considering Chen style to be the earliest style of Tai Chi. To the best of my knowledge, Chen style was developed upon Qi Ji Guang's military training manual and some other martial styles such as Hong Tong Tong Bei. In the Chinese martial art community, we need to have solid evidence and one discussing the historical events such as the founder of a style or the precursor or mother form of the style. Or else, any such discussion is just a story. Unless there is any solid evidence, I think it may be the same case with Wu Qi Zhang as well. So, it would be the responsibility of the claimant to provide evidence 
in support of the existence of that style. I hope that answers your question, William. Let's move on to the next one. Save lives, ask, quote. Are Qigong or Nei Gong and Xiu Dao intention-based practices or not? Meaning, does the practitioner perform the practice with an intention of achieving some specific result? End quote. Thank you, Save Lives, and a great channel name, by the way. This is a good question. I plan to make a dedicated video to explain this topic in much more detail. However, let me give you a brief answer in today's video. First and foremost, Qigong and Xiu Dao are different. Qigong has been a popular term since the 1950s in China. Qigong practice has been offering great benefits to many people not only in China but also in the West. Well, Qigong practice is based on many traditional practices that have existed for thousands of years in China. The actual systematic creation, promotion, and practice of Qigong, as we know it today, occurred mainly during the 1980s and the 1990s in China. I practiced many different styles of Qigong in China and have also witnessed the development as well as the subsequent decline of this practice over there. So, Qigong is the great energetic practice that can provide plenty of health benefits. However, Xiu Dao is different in terms of the practical approach. Xiu Dao, known by other names throughout history, such as Dan Dao or Elixir Wei, among others, uses a static approach to training, meaning that a practitioner should let the prenatal energy rise by itself instead of using the mind to initiate it, as in Qigong. This is the most important difference between these two practices. So, the result of Xiu Dao can be much more profound in terms of energetic experiences compared to Qigong. Qigong practice focuses on a dynamic approach and expects to enter the static state at the end, which is just the starting point of Xiu Dao. This is why the benefits offered by Xiu Dao are much more profound than Qigong. It is worth noting that if you want to achieve faster results in terms of health, Qigong is a better choice than Xiu Dao, since it directly works on energy and energetic practice can help the body recover from many health conditions if practiced correctly. So, Qigong can be practiced as the preparation form of Xiu Dao. The energetic experience offered by Xiu Dao just cannot be replaced by the practice of Qigong. That is to answer the first part of your question. Now, let's talk about the second part of your question regarding the expectation while practicing them. Yes, when practicing Qigong, circulating, gathering, and accumulating energy for the benefit of the body is the expectation. However, when practicing Xiu Dao, the practitioner's mind should be devoid of any expectations since the practitioner needs to enter a prenatal state, which requires an energy rising experience without any expectations, or else prenatal energy will not rise, which makes any expectation a blockage. Save lives. I hope I have answered your question. Let's move on to the next one. TP asks some questions about Lao Cha Tou 
including how to brew this tea for 20 infusions and the possibility to keep tea leaves overnight in the refrigerator for use the next day. First of all, a good quality Lao Cha Tou tea can brew at least 20 infusions. You can just add hot water into your teapot and wait for 10 seconds each time, which is the standard way to brew this tea. The proportion between tea and the water is 1 to 50. So, 3 grams of tea will need 150 ml of water. Or if you prefer a stronger flavor, then 1 to 30 is a better proportion. Again, it depends on the quality of your tea. The rituals I mentioned are just the popular ones. Of course, you can refrigerate tea leaves overnight for later consumption. However, the flavor is not as good as one freshly consumed. I have never heard about this way of drinking tea before, but it should be fine if you do not mind compromising the tea flavor. Tea is consumed for its flavor, so consuming tea brewed from leaves refrigerated overnight defeats the whole purpose, in my opinion. I hope that answers your question, TP. Let's move on to the next one. Da Cheng Ruo Chue asks, quote, On this question, not the criticism, why is when certain things get translated into English, the word dragon seems to be inserted where it wasn't? Like the one in English is the dragon served tea. Why? And uh, that's and uh, what is it actually in Chinese? I have heard people uh, I say Lian Cha Bei, but that sounds more like a nickname. In the code. He also gave uh, another example of Wen Chang's staff training since the word dragon is also added to its English name, but no such word is to be found in Chinese. Thank you, Da Sheng Ruoque. This is such an interesting culture related question. I totally agree with you that English translations very often use the word dragon even though no such term exists in the original Chinese usage. First of all, I have no idea who made these translations. If they were translated by a native Chinese speaker, then I have to say that it's indeed very strange. If they were translated by non-native Chinese speakers, then they might have assumed that Chinese people would prefer the word dragon. That is just my speculation. I can't say with any certainty until I know details about the translator's linguistic and cultural background. I totally agree with you on the translation of a Wen Chuan weapon practice by inserting the word dragon. Also, in the case of Ba Gua, some translated names make no sense whatsoever. For example, how can a dragon serve tea? Even worse, placing a teacup on your hand will hinder the quality of your practice since a lot of detailed empty hand techniques cannot be achieved by placing a teacup on the hand. That is why when I practice and teach Bagua, I never place a teacup on my hand and I recommend you leave your hands empty too. Using an animal to name an unrelated martial movement is, in my opinion, just wrong. I hope that answers the question, Da Sheng Ruoque. Now, let's look at the final question for today. Neil Melny asked about Fa Jin, quote, When doing any Fa Jin with fist, elbow, or shoulder strike, do you have to combine the groaning movement with the waist turning and finally strike sinking one side of the chest from the side but not the opposite side. Thank you, Neil. This is a great Fa Jin related question. 
Your question tells me you are very detail oriented in practice, which is a great approach, especially to the internal styles. Different striking areas have different practices for Fa Jin. Overall, in Fa Jin execution, major areas such as the shoulders, hips, and the waist may turn or remain stable depending on the movement. It also depends on the direction of your fajin movement. For example, normally, when you stri strike downward with your elbow in a fajin movement, the body sinks downward, shoulders extend downward and outward, the front hip sinks while the back hip pushes forward. The front knee extends forward while the back knee extends slightly upward. The groin area maintains the same state without extra strength or other coordination. This is just an example of a body coordination when executing a high quality elbow fajin. That example only considered a direct forward strike with the elbow. Fa Jin involving other large areas such as the shoulders and the chest will involve more complicated coordination, and it is more three-dimensional compared to other smaller areas, which is complicated to describe and thus hard to do in Q&A videos. I will talk about it in the future. Now, I hope I have answered your question. Thank you once again for such a good question. Those were all the questions for today. Thank you all once again for your questions and I hope you find my answers informative. As always, please do not hesitate to ask follow-up questions or entirely new questions altogether. Thank you for watching, see you next time, and enjoy your practice.